I am as excited as you are for this evening's program because this is a very, very special guest that we have this evening. Three special guests that we have this evening for performance. Okay, so Susan and Lewis, you are on. We live in a time and with news feeds that remind us constantly of people who are facing trauma, being uprooted and shaken from home and stability and safety. We gather tonight to hear of an extraordinary life, and Lewis Fisher and I are honored to bring us to focus on Mr. Ullman's story by starting with a bit of music. Jews have lived all over the world as guests in many lands and cultures, and we have spoken vernacular languages that combine, in many cases, snippets of our holy writings with the languages of our neighbors. We have records of Judeo-Arabic, Judeo-Spanish or Ladino, Judeo-Italian, Aramaic, and in Eastern Europe, Yiddish, a language over 1,000 years old that is structured around Middle High German, Biblical Hebrew, and a smattering of Balkan and Romance languages. I'm guessing that Yiddish was not a household language in Mr. Ullman's experience as a young person, but the songs we offer tonight cross beyond the specific and touch deeper experiences of building a life in the face of strife, of looking back and looking forward, and of recognizing what binds us together in this very messy human family. In pre-World War II Lithuania, the city of Vilnius, called Vilna by the Jews, was known as the Jerusalem of Lithuania, a bustling center of science, biblical and cultural study, wide ranges of political expression, and literary and artistic brilliance. The loss of this hub of Jewish life to the onset of Nazism was incalculable. Written as a poem by Wolfson and set to music by Alexander Olshanensky, this first song of deep longing captured the way people came to look back with a lens that crystallized a place and came to a moment in time. It was written that nearly every permitted cultural program presented in the Vilna ghetto under Nazi rule began with the singing of this song, Vilna. Vilna, Stadt von Geist und Mimes, Vilna, Yiddish Lech Vertracht, wo es Stille Twilles, Stille Seudes von der Nacht, Oft muss er dir in Holm, Heis geliebte Wilne mein, Um die alte Wilne Götter in an Appeldicken Wilde, wilde, unser Heimstadt, unser Bekschaft und Bagel. Ach, wie oft es ruft dein Namen von mein Euger Reisatrer. Wilner Gessler, Wilner Teichen, Wilner Wälder, Barg und Tor. Erbes Neue. Epes bengt sich noch die Zeiten von Amor. Ich seh dem wilde Lesakreter in sein Schotten eingehüllt, wo geheimes Augen leerer unser Wissen durchgestillt. Wilne hat den ersten vor dem Freiheit von Gebet und die Liebe. 
liebe Kinder, ihr mit dem zarten Geist ballert. Wilde, wilde, unser Heimstadt, unser Bergschaft und Bagger. Ach, wie oft es ruft dein Namen von meinen Eugern und Satrer. Wilner Gessler, Wilner Teichen, Wilner Wilder Bar und Tor. Eppes Neuet, Eppes bringt sich noch die Zeiten von Amor. I welcome Lewis Fisher to join me now in a medley of two songs that could not be further apart from one another and yet bind themselves together with a thread of hope. If you care to applaud, please wait till we finish the second song. Thank you for that. Lena Kalper was an activist. Oh, he was actually an anarchist, if we name him properly. In the very early 20th century, more than 100 years ago, Leibig stood up to the Tsar's regime until he was arrested and taken in chains to a political tribunal. He refused to renounce his strong negative stance against the government and was shipped off to Siberia for a life sentence of hard labor. If this weren't so current an issue, it would be bad enough. The political underground at the time, though, <coughs> trapped him and managed to sneak him away to freedom, but he couldn't stay in Russia. So he came to New York, where he became a celebrated teacher, poet, and political activist, of course. We'll perform his poem, Er geht's weit, Somewhere Far Away, which is an artistic vision of Siberian captivity with a promise of the treasure of freedom far below the snow. The second song is one that might have qu appear quite insouciant, saying that nothing much matters as long as I can walk a sunny path. But this too, in the words of Pepirnikov, has a backstory. Here is a vision of people who faced displacement, oppression, and loss, and remained true to a belief that a better life is possible. Thank you. 
has since traveled the world and has never lost its verb or its relevance. In the ensuing years, the song likely had hundreds of sets of lyrics applied to it. Think of this, a melody with hundreds of different people making it the diary of their lives by putting their own experiences to that melody. One version we know of is called in Kryówkę. The Kryówkę is a Polish word for the dugout shelter that was used by thousands of Jews in hiding in the forests of Russia and Poland throughout the war years, sometimes for years at a time. But no matter the version, the song is one of hope that we will continue to find in our yearning the power of survival, and human love. Spiel Jamil al Lidele in Yiddish. Thank you. 
Lonerzingens Lieder zusammen. Ich habe mit viel Lonerzingen Lieder zusammen. Wie gute Freien, wie Kinder von den Mammen. Meine einzige Verlang, so klingen frei und frank. In allem ins Gesang, auch mein Gesang. Oh, spiel, spiel, kläs mir und spiel. Weißt du, was ich will und was ich will? Spiel, spiel, spiel ein Lieder mit mir. Spiel ein Lieder mit Herz und mit Gefühl. I could say a lot about Mr. Ullman, but um, we have a little YouTube that we're going to try and get up here that will say it all for us in a very short time. Um, but I have another story that I would like to share about Leo Ullman. I always tear up, sorry. Um, and it's because he is the owner of Newberry Commons. And we had another building, we were a freestanding building that used to look like a steakhouse and we turned it into a library <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were there and very happy and then one day I got an eviction notice so I didn't like Mr. Holman at the beginning and then I found out that he said I want your library to be in Newberry Commons so we have another space and not only did we come up and look at this space but he renovated this space and turned it into a library. Oh. So, that's, that's my Leo Ullman story. <laughs> Mr. Ullman, come on up um, and be ready for, uh, as soon as your little video is over, then you're gonna start, okay? <laughs> oh, he wants it to go. Yeah, never mind. Is one of the most interesting people I have ever met. Can you hear? He's a Harvard grad, a wildly successful entrepreneur, a philanthropist, and an accomplished athlete who has completed 145 triathlons. And that's barely scratching the surface of this man's extraordinary life. My life was not defined by the Holocaust. The 83-year-old who lives in this beautiful home on the water in Sands Point, Long Island, is among the youngest Holocaust survivors. He wasn't even a year old when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands in May of 1940. At first, my parents and I had the chance to escape. We went to a fishing port in Holland. The scene at the fishing port was utter chaos. There were not big boats taking people to England. Rather, it was just a lot of people hoping to get onto a fishing boat or two. Leo and his parents, named Frank and Emily Ullman, could not get onto one of those boats. Life in the Netherlands soon became increasingly more difficult for the Jews. It started with decrees. First, for all of the countries, approximately 140,000 Jews to relocate to the country's capital city of Amsterdam. Every Jew had to have a J on his identity card, and every male Jew had to include the name Simon as a middle name, and every female Jew had to include the word Sarah as her middle name. And then it got even worse as transports to forced labor and death camps began. People who were elderly, invalid, uh, children were being pushed into cattle cars. Leo's parents felt they had no choice but to go into hiding in March of 1943 when Leo was three years old. With help from Emily's friends in the resistance, they secured this hiding place for Leo in the apartment of a Christian family. It was an unimaginable decision to separate from their little boy, not knowing if they'd ever see him again. Frank and Emily hid in this attic of a storefront on a main street right in the heart of the city, the same city where Anne Frank was in hiding with her family. Every step outside, every motorized vehicle, every noise 
uh, could have met the end of their lives. And to live under that kind of unbelievable pressure and terror is something you can't replicate in a, in a play about Anne Frank or in anything else. Leo and his parents miraculously survived the war. A Dutch policeman and his wife risked their lives to hide Leo and treated him as if he was their own son. Leo is still in touch with the descendants of his war parents. I always wondered why in the world my war mother and father would take this ultimate risk to take in a Jewish child under circumstances where the Nazis were paying huge bounties for anybody that betrayed a Jew and they would almost certainly kill anybody who was hiding a Jew. And I always ask my war mother, why in the world would you do that? And she said, because it was the right thing to do. Ordinary people doing extraordinary deeds in the face of absolute death. For Leo, sharing his survival story is critical, especially now, as we see a spike in anti-Semitism across the globe. If we don't tell that story, who is there to tell it? And I also realize that I'm among the youngest survivors. Soon there won't be anybody to tell this story. And therefore, I felt it was very important for me to do that. And here in the U.S., Leo started a whole new chapter. After the war, his parents had another baby, Leo's younger brother, Henry. In 1947, the family made its way to New York. Leo remembers being on that ship like it was yesterday. We were on the Westerdam, a converted Liberty ship, and we came to New York in the fog and drizzle, and suddenly the Statue of Liberty appeared. Tears were streaming down my mother's face, and she said, I have trouble saying it, we beat Hitler. And beat Hitler, they did. The Ullman family moved to this home in Port Washington, Long Island, and quickly integrated themselves into the community. Leo wasn't sufficiently challenged academically in the public school system, and he finished high school at the renowned Andover Prep in Massachusetts. He then graduated in three and a half years from Harvard, where he was also the goalie for the Harvard lacrosse team. He even took a term off from Harvard before graduating to join the Marine Corps. He was in the reserves for five and a half years while also earning his JD MBA from Columbia. This is where I spend a huge part of my life. Here's a glimpse into Leo's Port Washington office for his real estate management company called Vast Good Properties. He started it after leaving his former company, which went public. This is Leo's advice to up and coming entrepreneurs and those interested in real estate. Don't be afraid to put it all on the line. Go out if you can and get a two family home and rent it and uh, then buy a four family and then buy a small apartment building and maybe you get a, a little office building here and there. And it works if you're careful. And there's no magic to real estate. It's all common sense. It's not more than that. Leo's company owns 19 shopping centers, mostly in Pennsylvania, and most of them anchored by giant supermarkets. He takes great pride in his properties and says he's always honest and goes out of his way to show his tenants respect and to learn their stories. Leo's work definitely does fund some of his incredibly interesting hobbies. He recently donated to a university his entire private collection of Nolan Ryan cards and memorabilia. Nolan Ryan is one of the ultimate power pitchers in Major League Baseball who pitched for 27 years and holds the records for no hitters and most strikeouts. Leo's collection had about 15,000 items and took him 29 years to accumulate. It's valued at approximately $1.2 million. Leo also wrote a book about his collection, which will be published soon. My goal at this point is simply to have the book be beautiful. I want it to be evidence of all the work that I've put into it. I don't have to make a nickel on it. Leo's writing portfolio doesn't stop there. He penned this book about his Holocaust survival story called 796 Days. 
And back at his beautiful home, Leo's wife Kay, of 63 years, who is also his high school sweetheart, shares how important she believes it is for Leo to tell his tale to anyone who will listen, especially since Leo is an increasingly rare first-hand witness. I think that's most important most important that he's a primary source. My story on Leo could be never ending. This man is a force to be reckoned with. He has biked across the country, completed 145 triathlons and three Ironman races. Together, he and Kay have four children and nine grandchildren. It was always my mother's credo that we beat Hitler. And how did we beat them? We created it what we think is a wonderful family. A wonderful family and a powerful legacy, Leo's greatest revenge against the Nazis. In Sands Point, Long Island, Dana Arshin, HMTC. Thank you all. Can you hear me? Yes. Shoot. Um, first of all, I, I want to mention the beautiful voice that Susan had. You're not going to hear it from me, so <laughs> I, I thought it was terrific. Um, my story basically is focused on the country of the Netherlands. Everybody calls it Holland because Holland was the largest province of the Netherlands. And um, Holland is a lot easier to say than the Netherlands, especially to Dutchmen. At any rate, um, the story starts with my parents. Uh, my mother uh, came from a well-to-do family uh, engaged in the diamond business. My father um, was born in Germany and came to Holland um, at the age of 18 because he did not see a future in Germany. Um, he came to Holland in 1932 and in 1936, he and my mother married. Um, in 1939, um, they were able to create this unbelievable wild little kid. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Holland. Um, in 1939-1940, uh, uh, there were approximately nine million people in the Netherlands. Of those nine million, there were approximately 145,000 Jews. Of those 145,000 Jews, 85,000 lived in Amsterdam. Of those who lived in Amsterdam, 25,000 were engaged in the diamond business. And as I mentioned, my mother's family was in the diamond business and lived very well. They were fully, completely integrated into Dutch society. There was no meaningful anti-Semitism. Um, they belonged to sororities. Uh, they um, had friends of all sorts. They were involved in music and uh, the arts. Uh, they were very comfortable. In 1939, Hitler had promised to the Dutch that if he opened a uh, war zone um, on the west side of Europe, he would leave uh, Holland alone because Holland was neutral during World War I and fully expected to be neutral if there were, in fact, uh, a war that would extend beyond the eastern flank uh, where Austria and um, Poland had been invaded. Um, and everybody in Holland assumed that if there were a western front, they would be left alone. Notwithstanding that promise, as late as September of 1939, on May uh, 10th, 1940, uh, Hitler and his troops bombed the city of Rotterdam to smithereens. Um, more than 20,000 people were uh, killed. Um, 
60,000 were left uh, without uh, housing. And um, Hitler threatened to take over the rest of Holland in a matter of a couple of days. The Dutch government left the country. The queen took her cabinet and went to England, and her family went on to Canada. And um, a lot of Jews committed suicide, uh, afraid that they would have to live under Hitler. Um, some Jews were able to escape, and we had the chance to escape. We went to a port, a fishing port, where you could potentially catch a fishing boat to take you to England, and then you might have a chance to go to America or to Canada. My parents and I and a grandmother uh, went to one of the fishing ports and it was utter chaos. The rumors that there were lots of boats to take people were not true. Uh, it was just uh, a terrible scene. And my grandmother had an earache and I had a toothache or vice versa. And we uh, went back to our apartment thinking that we would um, leave on another day. Within a couple of days, the Nazis closed the borders. Um, my mother's sister and her family were able to escape. I had a couple of uncles who were able to escape with their families. But we went back to our apartment and we uh, did not see a chance to escape. What happened first was that Hitler appointed a vicious anti-Semite who had been the governor of Austria after it had been taken over. His name was Seiss Inquart. And Seiss Inquart um, started issuing decrees once he took over the country. Um, the decrees were targeted toward the Jews. And they started with the requirement that all Jews had to come to Amsterdam. So in the apartment that my parents and I had, suddenly we had eight additional people. But we, we would manage. And then all the Jews on age six or over had to wear a Jewish star. And that was okay. It had to be sewn so it couldn't be taken off so quickly. And the decree said that anybody who consorted with the Jews was subject to prison or worse. Um, the other decrees included that we had to um, file reports, the Jews did, of anything they owned of any value, up to and including gold teeth. We were then um, subjected to continuous and more severe uh, decrees. Uh, we could not go to public schools. We could not go to public markets. We could not use public parks. We could not have telephones. We could not have any um, vehicles, no bicycles, no cars, no motorcycles. Uh, we could not use public transportation. Um, we could not uh, go to um, public schools. We had to uh, go to special schools if, if we could. Um, but we were alive. Um, but these decrees kept coming. And at a given moment, my father, who had lost his job, all Jews lost their jobs in anything other than Jewish enterprises, um, my father um, received a call-up notice uh, in 1942, in the summer of 42. Uh, it was the same time as Margot Frank and sister received a call-up notice. Um, and basically, the idea was that able-bodied people should go to Germany and work in work camps. There were no killing camps at that point. And so my parents, being healthy, thought that it would be okay, that they would 
somehow survive, and they got ready to go, and my father went to the train station in Amsterdam and saw that people were not healthy that were going to uh, the work camps. Uh, there were kids, there were invalids, there were the elderly. Um, it didn't look right, and they were being pushed into cattle cars that were then locked. And he decided that they would not go, and they made the decision to go into hiding at the same time that my mother's sister and her family were picked up and thrown into jail and ultimately deported toward the work camps. Um, and my father thought that they had to go into hiding. That was a very, very difficult decision. I was at that point uh, three years old. Uh, they couldn't take me into hiding because uh, I would obviously act up. And um, they made the decision at that point to give me up to the resistance. That was very difficult. Um, the link to the resistance was a sorority sister of my mother. A sorority in Holland in those days was not just for college years, it was a lifetime. And um, that sorority link is probably critical to uh, saving me. Um, they decided that they had to give me up. And uh, through the resistance, through the sorority sister, they came in contact with a minister in the city of Harlem who um, placed Jewish kids uh, with families. Um, in the meantime, my father decided that they had to have money if they were going to go into hiding. And he thought he would need it for food, he would need it for rent. They found a hiding place uh, in an attic on a main street in Amsterdam, uh, above a shoe store, and then there was a family that lived right above that. that were responsible for the building, and above that was a young couple who went to work every day. And the attic above them is where my father and mother arranged to uh, rent an attic space with one window and no heat or electricity. Um, in the meantime, uh, as I said, my father felt that he had to get some money and he was a rug buyer uh, at the largest department store in Amsterdam, or in Holland, uh, the Macy's of Holland, called the Bayenkorf, the Beehive. And he decided um, that he would approach a rug dealer uh, who was a Muslim, and that he knew from his uh, work. And he w was able to arrange uh, to have a bunch of rugs that he would sell to uh, people in Amsterdam, largely even Jewish, uh, I'm sorry, largely even Nazi uh, uh, officers and so forth who had taken over uh, Jewish homes. And he was able to sell quite a lot of rugs during a short period of months. And then he went back to the rug dealer and he said, I, we have to go into hiding now. Uh, it was approaching March 1st of 1943, and that's when they decided they had to go into hiding completely. And uh, he gave back the rugs, and the rug dealer um, did something very special. I've got a bit of show and tell here. Bear with me one second. He gave my father a rug, and he said to my father, I know that you worship a different God than, than we, but take this rug with you into hiding, 
it's a prayer rug and it's a very good prayer rug because we've had it all of this time <laughs> um, take this into hiding with you and Allah will save you and my parents took this rug into hiding with them and it may be that Allah saved them it's a good story to tell especially when um, when I talk to uh, groups that include uh, uh, Muslim um, believers and um, I recently talked at Wagner College or Wagner University in New York I shared the podium with the Muslim chaplain of the New York police force and we've become good friends and at that gathering a young Muslim young lady came up to me and saw me rolling up this thing this prayer rug in this <coughs> manner and she said that's not how you do it and she, <laughs> and she taught me how to do it and how to fold it but I don't have time <laughs> Um, I wound up with a young man who lived outside uh, Amsterdam and his wife. Um, and shortly after I was placed there, uh, their marriage fell apart, probably because of me. Um, and I was then um, sent to a sort of orphanage north of the city of Amsterdam. And the mother and father of this young man decided that they sort of liked me <laughs> and he was a retired policeman and he was able to get a pass to go through the German lines at the station in Amsterdam and he was able to go to North Amsterdam on his bicycle and pick me up and take me back to their apartment on the west side of Amsterdam. Uh, he did that and I stayed with this man and his wife and their adopted daughter who was 14 or 15 years older than I. We shared a room. I teased her mercilessly. <laughs> I even said at one point, and this is um, it's not a, a good uh, remembrance for me but I should tell it. I, I said to my war parents that uh, I wish uh, Tilly, that was the uh, sister, the adopted, the adopted daughter, uh, I wish Tilly was dead, then we'd have more to eat. Oh. <laughs> That's nice, isn't it? Um, you should know that uh, Tilly and I became good friends. It's not, <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't last. Uh, but food was a serious problem and uh, we didn't um, didn't have normal food. I ate a lot of tulip bulbs and sugar beets um, because that's what we ate. I never knew that you shouldn't eat these kind of things. They, I thought they were okay. And also my war father um, had a girlfriend um, and she was in um, she worked in a bar in, uh, in the heart of Amsterdam and she was German. So she would come to know when there would be a raid, a razia as we called it, where they would block off uh, a block at a time and go door to door <coughs> looking for hidden Jews. In the meantime, there were substantial bounties paid for people who discovered hidden Jews and there were gangs that went around trying to find hidden Jews because it would be remunerated. Um, and that was, uh, that was very, very scary um, because um, anything could betray anybody. And, and the slightest noise, anything could, could cause a betrayal. But a couple of times that there were raids, uh, because uh, my war father had this German girlfriend in a bar that was frequented by um, Germans and Nazi soldiers, um, he would come to learn through her when there would be a raid. And then they would ship me out of the city to their son who lived in the suburbs <coughs> and uh, until the raids were over. Um, that was pretty important. 
um, this woman, his, uh, his girlfriend, was uh, known as Aunt Paula. I knew her as Aunt Paula. Um, at any rate, I lived with these people. Uh, we survived the war. And um, on May 5th of 1945, um, the city of Amsterdam was finally liberated. Uh, much of Europe uh, was liberated um, even in toward the end of 1944 and certainly before uh, May of 1945. But what happened is that uh, the American troops and the Canadians uh, went toward Berlin uh, after the battles in uh, eastern uh, Holland and also in Belgium and went straight toward Berlin and left the north of Holland uh, without food. That crisis of food was also um, exacerbated by the fact that uh, the Queen of uh, Holland, who was in uh, England and who was not terribly uh, supportive of the Jews, sadly enough, um, she decreed that uh, the Dutch rail system should no longer send um, equipment, factories, anything of metal um, to Germany, uh, which the Dutch had done, uh, up to and including church bells, for example, uh, to support the German war effort. Uh, the <coughs> Queen said that that could no longer be done and um, as a result of that, uh, the Germans uh, prohibited any further food shipments to Holland. <coughs> and meanwhile, there was a, a, a very severe winter and the canals were frozen and um, some 30,000 uh, people in uh, Holland and largely <coughs> in Amsterdam uh, starved during the hunger winter of 1944. At any rate, on May 5th, 1945, Amsterdam was liberated by uh, the Canadian Maple Leaf Brigade. And as a result of that, the Dutch have always been very close to Canada and to Canadian troops. And uh, the royal family, other than the Queen herself, wound up in Canada also. So we were liberated by uh, the Canadians and everybody on that day uh, went outside and uh, were cheering and hugging and screaming and everybody uh, wore uh, orange and I had to have an orange hat and I made my poor war parents and subsequently my real parents stand in line to get me an orange hat. Does anybody know why, why orange is so important? Golly, you guys better keep reading. Or, <laughs> or watch uh, some uh, international sports events involving the Dutch. Uh, the answer is that the Royal House of Holland is the House of Orange Nassau. And Orange plays such a role. So if you see Dutch teams in the Olympics or elsewhere, they're always wearing orange. Um, at any rate, um, my war parents knew that if my real parents survived the war, uh, they would come to get me shortly after this uh, May 5th liberation. And sure enough, within the next couple of days, um, the doorbell rang, and my war mother knew what it would be, and there came my real parents. Uh, they looked awful. I mean, they had been in their hiding place for uh, approximately two and a half years. My father never got out. His feet were this big because he couldn't walk. Um, my mother did get out uh, on uh, a couple of occasions, taking the ultimate risk uh, because she had a tooth pain that was so debilitating she couldn't live with it. And so she went to a street in Amsterdam known as Sarfatistraat where uh, there were um, 
known to be a number of uh, dentists. And she knocked on the door of this. She would go at dusk um, when a woman uh, could uh, presumably not be picked up by the Nazis. A young man would be picked up immediately and sent to, uh, to the war effort. Um, but she was able to go there and she knocked on the door of a, uh, of a um, dentist and she said that she couldn't pay him um, and she couldn't tell him who she was, um, but could he help her uh, because she had this terrible tooth problem. And he did. Um, and um, he told her to come back in a couple of days so that uh, he could take out the, the stitches. And uh, again at dusk she came and went to the guy and uh, he gave to her, not only did he take out the stitches, but he gave to her a loaf of bread mm -hmm. and that was worth anything. Um, at any rate, um, they came to the house where I was uh, in hiding. They had gotten uh, from the resistance uh, where I was. They never knew where I was. Mm -hmm. They never knew whether I was alive. That was the essence of what the resistance had to do. They couldn't run the risk of somebody finding out where people were in hiding. So uh, they came and uh, they looked awfully. Maybe they weighed 80 pounds. I, I just don't know, but they looked awful. And these two people said they were my parents. And I didn't know them. I had been away for two and a half years. I was three years old when the war started or when my hiding started. And these people suddenly appeared and said they were my parents. Um, I think that was difficult for everybody. I personally don't remember it very much. Um, appreciate that in hiding there were no photos. My hair was dyed blonde. I was kept inside after the first couple of weeks for the entire war. Um, and my war parents thought that nobody would know that they had this kid in hiding, this Jewish kid. Um, at any rate, um, they, um, my real parents took me to their hiding place and not for long. Um, we, they made an arrangement with my war parents that they would bridge this gap over a period of days or maybe weeks and uh, they cooperated with each other. It was very supportive and that's not necessarily uh, what happened in all cases. Uh, for hidden children, some were brutalized, many of them were adopted and put into a different religion. Um, and um, we just had a very exceptional uh, experience. At any rate, I went back with my parents uh, to their hiding place. And you have to appreciate that they were in this hiding place in one room for two and a half years, 24 hours a day. Um, I don't know, I, I mean, I'm in a canoe with my wife for an hour or two and it, <laughs> I, I, I mean, she doesn't paddle enough. I, I, don't even, I, I just don't know how you can possibly do that, but they, they somehow survived that. And um, they had saved uh, for the day that I would come back, a can of baked beans, and they had put it under the floorboards in their apartment for that special day when Leo would come back. So I came there with them, and they opened this can of baked beans with great ceremony, and uh, they offered it to me, and I said, I, I hate baked beans. So these poor people starved for two and a half years uh, with this baked beans available to them, and this is what happened. At any rate, we went back to the apartment where I'd spent the war, and my uh, <coughs> war parents uh, and the people in the apartment building had arranged a party and invited the whole block. And the amazing thing to me still is 
that with all these bounties that were paid and with all the difficulties that people had in Amsterdam, um, everybody knew that uh, the Schimmels, that's their names, um, that the Schimmels had a Jewish kid mm -hmm. and nobody betrayed them. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, um, <coughs> we did um, um, manage over a period of days or weeks to uh, to um, have me stay with my real parents. And one of the things that my war parents did that was very special, they gave me their dog. Uh, I think that was a bridge that was extremely meaningful. And I didn't realize it until much later how, how special that was. I also didn't realize, even until fairly recently, we have stayed in touch with the people who saved me and their, and their descendants to this day. Um, as a matter of fact, last week I was in Holland and I had a lunch with the great-grandson of the people who saved us. Um, that link, I mean, you know, where would you be without that? Um, so that has remained very important, but um, I stayed close to my war mother, my war father, um, my parents think, um, passed away in uh, Aunt Paula's bed. Um, <laughs> but, but the descendants, the descendants uh, of my war parents uh, are absolutely adamant that uh, he died in a taxi cab. So um, we'll never know, I think. At any rate, um, I stayed close to uh, my war family uh, to this day. We brought them to America and we've had talks at the University Club in New York and at various other venues. Um, and again, uh, we saw them, or part of them, uh, just this past week. Um, I think I should probably end it there um, and take any questions that you might have. And if you don't have any questions, I have a couple that I, <laughs> I could launch. Yes? Do you take your so while? for the two and a half years, and did you go out of the house? Did you, um, At, I mean, they dyed your hair, they tried to make you look like you were one of them, but people knew that you lived there, and nobody else turned this family in for taking you in, which is amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. But um, we donated a, um, a room at Stockton University, which you may not know. It's a state university in the southern part of New Jersey, about 12 miles north of uh, Atlantic City. And it has several campuses. And it has the most active um, Holocaust Resource Center of any college that I'm aware of, and I've been to a lot of these colleges, including in this area. Um, they have undergraduate courses in Holocaust studies. Um, they have um, um, a master's degree and a doctorate degree in Holocaust studies. Um, and it's good uh, in New Jersey. New Jersey requires study of the Holocaust, and not everybody does it equally, but in the South Jersey uh, it's very strong, and um, we have given a room in that university to honor the people who saved us, and the motto in the room, and the motto of a, a film that's been made subsequently, is that there were, um, that there were ordinary people uh, doing extraordinary deeds. Mm -hmm. um, and ordinary is not a fair description because these weren't ordinary people, but these were not gifted, special kind of people. They were just regular people. Um, I stayed close to my war parents. My war father died in uh, early 50s. Uh, under circumstances I described, but um, my war mothers uh, lived until uh, the 80s, 
and I was at her uh, her deathbed. I, in those days, went to Holland uh, 10, 12 times a year because uh, I practiced law and my uh, clients were mostly Dutch uh, because I speak, read, and write Dutch. Um, and um, um, I, uh, in addition to asking her, you know, why she would do this, as you heard on the film, um, I asked if there was anything I could get her, anything at all. And um, she said she wanted a pocketbook. <laughs> so I jumped in my car. I drove from Utrecht, which is where she was at an, um, an elderly living facility. Uh, I jumped in my car, went to Amsterdam, went to the best street in Amsterdam. I went to the best store and I bought the most beautiful Gucci Pucci uh, <laughs> pocketbook. And, and um, she stroked it a few times, but she never used it. Um, at any rate, um, I'll, again, I'll stop there. And I'd, I'd welcome another question if somebody would have one. Yes, please. I was wondering, um, did it take you a long time to um, bond with your with your birth parents when they came and found you? Did you know, I honestly don't know the answer to that mm -hmm. because um, my war parents stayed in my life until we left Holland. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, my war father uh, walked me to school every day. Uh, they gave me their dog, and also um, I had an eye operation uh, shortly after the war. Uh, he was at the hospital every day. Mm -hmm. So I think the transition was relatively easy. Mm -hmm. My parents, after the war, were able to get a house. My father got his job back. He got some compensation. Mm -hmm. and. Um, they had a little car, they had a nice uh, little house. Um, you would think everything was pretty good, but it wasn't because all of their friends had disappeared. Uh, of the 140,000 Jews uh, in uh, the beginning of the war, um, after the war only 14,000 were left in Holland. Some had left but the statistics are that more than 75 percent of the Dutch Jews uh, lost their lives during the war. Mm. Um, so life wasn't so good because their friends were gone, the Dutch economy was in the dumps, and in the meantime my maternal grandmother uh, who had been able to uh, put money away uh, before the war, uh, moved to New York City, and my mother's sister was able to get out during those first couple of days and move to Port Washington, Long Island, which is where we live now. My grandmother bought us a house in Port Washington, and we decided that we would emigrate. It was uh, at the end of 1947, was. November, December 1947, uh, when we came to America. And I didn't speak a word of English. And in those days, you didn't have Essel or Tessel or whatever these things are now. Um, so I would go to the principal's office and she would point to this or this and say, this is a shirt and that's a belt or, uh, or vice versa, whatever. Um, and. Um, Anyway, the, the rest of the story is, uh, has a good ending. <laughs> yes, ma'am. How old were your birth parents when they passed? I mean, how old were the, the birth parents when they passed away? Uh, how old were my war parents when they... Not your birth, but your natural parents. My natural parents. Yeah. How old were they? When they gave me up? No. Or what? When they passed. Oh, when, when they, they passed. My mother died in uh, the year 2000, so she was 87. My father lived until he was 96. He swore that if my mother died, he would cut his wrists. But he never did. Uh, and he had a girlfriend for years. So. <laughs> At any rate. Uh, yes, sir. 
Yeah. So when you returned to Holland, the buildings that you had hidden in, were they still there? Yes. They uh, the short answer is yes. And as recently as last week, I took uh, uh, a granddaughter who came in from London, met us in Amsterdam, on a route tour to show her uh, uh, all the places. Well, uh, in Amsterdam, it's, it's all landmarked. I mean, you can't move a brick in Amsterdam without permits. So everything uh, is really very much the same. And we took a taxi ride uh, and showed everything uh, to our granddaughter, including um, a statuette of Anne Frank that the taxi driver didn't even know existed. <laughs> but we lived, uh, my wife and I, after law school, lived uh, a year and a half in Holland. Mm -hmm. And that was very meaningful for me. Um, my wife was terribly afraid that we would not go back to America. I didn't earn enough money while in Holland to get us a plane ticket back, so <laughs> she was really terrified. And uh, thank goodness my father came along and bought us an airplane ticket back, because I was having a great time in Holland. I just, I, I just loved it. Uh, we had a daughter born in Holland, and we had a daughter who uh, went with us to Holland. I'm going to talk about one other thing uh, that some people ask, and that is, uh, is your story, isn't your story the same as Anne Frank? And I'd like to focus on that a little bit. Um, Anne Frank was German. Um, they spoke German. Uh, they lived in an area with all Germans. Um, they were never Dutch citizens. They didn't have the support group like my mother's sorority, for example. And they lived with eight people in that back room. They were doomed. Mm -hmm. There was not a chance that they would survive under, you know, the the pressure that was created by the Nazis in Amsterdam to get to get Jews, get rid of Jews. So that part of it is very different and it isn't comparable in my mind at all. Um, but um, I have a little twist to the Anne Frank story. Um, I was the head of uh, the Anne Frank Center in the US for many years. And during that time, I um, stayed very close to the Dutch and Frank house. And last week, uh, with this granddaughter, we went to that Anne Frank house again. Um, and um, they had fired uh, the financial director uh, in Amsterdam. And um, that financial director stayed very close to Otto Frank, the father of Anne Frank, who moved in 1951 to Basel, Switzerland. Um, and he had all the rights to the diary. Um, the diary itself, of course, is in the Anne Frank house in Amsterdam, but the rights to exploit uh, the copyright uh, is totally in this uh, a foundation in Basel. Um, this man who was fired came to me and asked me for a job and I gave him a job as an international consultant or whatever and he came to me at a given moment with a manila envelope and in it were five pages handwritten of Anne Frank's diary that had never seen the light of day. And what happened was that Otto Frank, the father, did not want these pages to be published because they were very, very nasty uh, about her mother and to some extent about the father, but they also talked about her becoming a woman. Mm -hmm. And Otto Frank did not want those pages uh, published. Mm -hmm. So um, here comes this manila envelope with these five pages and this man, Korsak was his name, says to me, Leo, why don't you take care of this? And I had gone to law school. I mean, nobody taught you what you do with five pages of the Anne Frank diary. <laughs> uh, 
So I offered it, of course, to the Anne Frank House first, and they wouldn't touch it. They thought it was stolen, and they doubted that it was authentic. And so I decided that we had to sell it, and we made a deal with Corsac that half the proceeds would go to the Anne Frank Center in New York, and he would keep half the f proceeds in a foundation that he created. Just before we were about to sell it at auction and some Russian oligarch would have bought it, um, the Dutch um, Center for um, War uh, Studies, um, Institute for uh, War Documentation, uh, they bought it for $300,000, which at the time was real money. I had gone to the uh, Morgan Library to find out if these pages had any value, and of course they do. Um, and um, those five pages were subsequently authenticated, and as a result, since 2003, those five pages are in the diary. Mm -hmm. So that's my Anne Frank connection, which I thought was a little different. Mm -hmm. um, have I generated any other questions? And if, if not, I'm happy to end it there. Oh, yes, sir. Your, the house that you lived in with the uh, parents, <coughs> the other parents, uh, your war parents, how close to the Anne Frank house uh, was it? Not very close. Uh, the Anne Frank House is very close to the uh, the Dam Square, which is the heart of Amsterdam, where the Queen's Palace is, and the so-called New Church, which is from the 1500s, um, and uh, the Amstel River basically ends there and goes into the ocean. Um, so. Um, where I stayed was in the western side of Amsterdam, and uh, Anne Frank, it probably, I don't know, a mile and a half, two miles, in a city. Yeah, and my parents were in hiding on the eastern side of Amsterdam, uh, also not terribly close to, uh, to where Anne, Frank, uh, Anne Frank's uh, OPEC uh, uh, factory building was. Yes, ma'am. If or what advice or what do you want kids to take away from your experiences? Like, if you if you could talk to a classroom of kids. Well, I I have been talking to uh, classrooms. Uh, and that's the origin of the book that we created. I created with uh, an illustrator. Um, it's targeting kids, and what I, it's you don't want to scare kids. Um, and so the focus for me uh, personally, and also the story, has to be uh, that there were these good people doing extraordinary deeds, and we were saved by people like that. Um, my um, father's family was saved by a, a, another policeman uh, who was on active duty in the city of Utrecht. And um, my uh, grandparents on my father's side lived openly uh, with false IDs and they spoke fluent German because the father was German. Um, and they lived in an apartment with a German a young woman, believe it or not, and who pretended that they were uh, their parents. So they lived openly, and um, in April of 1945, just before the war ended in Amsterdam, um, the, there were some German um, policemen who came into the apartment where they were living, and he looked at uh, their papers, which appeared to be very good. Uh, of course, they were forged. Um, incidentally, those fake IDs usually took names from tombs in uh, Gentile cemeteries. Mm -hmm. um, at any rate, uh, they um, 
um, looked at those papers. The papers were good, and so he asked uh, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, to look at his wedding ring. And he took off his wedding ring, and the initials in the wedding ring did not match the fake ID. So in April of 1945, my maternal grandparents were thrown into jail. Mm. Uh, they were only there for one month and, you know, the, the war was over. But um, it's, it's a nice ending anyway. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. How do you respond to people who say that the Holocaust never took place? Well, um, one of the things that's very powerful in this regard, believe it or not, is the um, um, the um, story of uh, the guy who actually uh, put Anne Frank uh, into uh, into uh, the ultimate uh, <coughs> deportation and so forth? Um, the Simon Wiesenthal Center, which is based in California. Uh, is very powerful in this regard and uh, they have kept um, the story of uh, Simon Wiesenthal who found 5,000 people who, uh, who, who um, uh, killed Jews or, or betrayed Jews or whatever and one of them he found and he said it's the best one he found and that person never went to jail but he found the person who uh, jailed Anne Frank and he felt that that was the proof that people needed that this really happened that this guy uh, was there and I, I don't think that um, that those uh, deniers are believable there is so much proof that uh, it all happened and it's it's just never been a problem for me um, what's been a problem for me is what's happening now and I cannot I cannot understand it or explain it um, and it's horrible beyond belief um, and I'm always afraid of getting questions about it because I don't have any answers I, I don't think anybody does but um, maybe Tom Friedman, if anybody, but uh, other than that, I, I don't have answers. Any other questions? I, I think I've <coughs> lulled you all to sleep, and I, I appreciate your being here, and thank you very much. Thank you yeah. very much. Just a little thank you gift. Um, I want to thank you for two things. I want to thank you for coming and telling your compelling story this evening, and I want to thank you for our lovely library. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> okay, we have refreshments in the community room. Um, the book sales are up at the circulation desk, but the book signing, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> will be, well, if I don't hurt him, will be in the, uh, will be in the community room. Um, the thank you gifts are from Brown's Orchard and Bar Market, which I love to go to. And the refreshments in the community room are by Cody Cully and his service.